Uh, okay, let's get started. Uh, so thanks for coming to today's seminar. Uh, we have Trevor Wright from the uh, from our new groups at the uh, University of Colorado here today. Started his grad school here at Yale, where he's working with David Mill for two years uh, before he transferred over to the University of Colorado, Colorado Boulder. And now uh, today he's going to give us some uh, recent results from the group on measuring the electron electric dipole moments. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, that's right. I'm uh, here from Colorado. Uh, we don't have a cool acronym or uh, logo, so we have a nice picture of the mountains uh, to show off. Uh, we work over here in the, the older part of the building, but uh, new parts are next to it. Uh, yeah, so thank you for coming to my talk, and I'll be telling you about the Electron EDM. Uh, so before I get started, I'd like to thank the wonderful people I work with and our funding agencies. The experiment, uh, like Thomas said, is, is co-run by Eric Cornell and Jean Yee. Uh, and I'll be telling you today about our Generation 2 result, uh, which I've been working on for the past few years. Tanya was our senior graduate student. She's graduated, uh, and Luke, our postdoc, will be starting a faculty position this fall. Uh, and then towards the end of the talk, I'll tell you a little bit about our Generation 3 measurement, which should be five plus ish years down the line, and hopefully be an order of magnitude better measurement uh, of the electron EDM. So why are we interested uh, in measuring the electron's electric dipole moment? I'll start with just a very brief history of the universe. So once upon a time, uh, the Big Bang happened. It might have looked something like that. I'm not sure. Uh, but after the Big Bang, the universe was very energetic and it was very uh, dense. And that's the perfect conditions for hair production to happen. So particles uh, and the antiparticle partners could pop into existence. And here on the screen, I have all the particles that I as an animal physicist know about, uh, except for photons, I guess. Uh, and so we have uh, neutrons, protons, electrons, and the particle partners. Um, and there were a whole bunch of them that appeared just after the Big Bang. Now, eventually, uh, as the universe expanded, it cooled down, and there was no longer enough energy for pair production. So the particles and the particles found one another uh, and annihilated, which we describe the Feynman diagram to look like this, uh, leaving the universe with a whole bunch uh, of photons and almost no matter or antimatter at all. Uh, but afterwards, something weird happened. There was no more antimatter, but we still had a little bit uh, of regular matter left over. And so we'd like to understand uh, and characterize this uh, asymmetry between matter and antimatter and try to explain uh, how it happened. And the way that uh, physicists frequently do that is by defining something called the baryon asymmetry of the universe. The BAU uh, is just the number of baryons minus the number of antibaryons divided by their sum. So it's a number that can range from negative one to positive one. And we really like to know what this ratio was uh, uh, right after the universe cooled down enough to no longer produce more baryons or antibaryons. That will tell us uh, something about the initial conditions that led to uh, uh, the little bit of matter we have left over now. Astronomers are really clever. They can go out and measure a whole lot, a lot of things, but they can't measure particles that aren't there anymore. So what they do instead is they can measure something about the universe uh, as it currently is. This denominator, the sum of baryons plus antibaryons, is something like the total number of photons in the universe. There's when a baryon and antibaryon annihilate, they make two photons. And the numerator we can simplify because there are no more uh, antimatter particles in the universe. So that just leaves us with a ratio of baryons to uh, photons, which astronomers have two separate ways of measuring. Those measurements agree with about one sigma with each other. What they find is this ratio is about a part per billion. What that tells us is that for every uh, billion antibaryons that were in the early universe, there were a billion one regular baryons, and that one additional regular baryon survived this process of annihilation, and it makes up all the matter inside of you and me, stars, planets, galaxies, everything. Uh, it's just this one additional uh, uh, baryon that survived the process of annihilation. So this is what uh, astronomers observe, and we know about the universe currently, and the question now is, do we have a theory of particle physics that can explain uh, where this one additional uh, regular baryon came from? And so that's what a Russian theorist named Sakharov thought about in the 1960s. And he came up with three conditions on particle physics that must be true in order for us to have more matter than antimatter. Uh, particularly, we'd like to get uh, this ratio here. And so the three conditions that there has to be a baryon number violation. Um, when the Big Bang happened, there were no, before the Big Bang happened, there were no particles. The net baryon number, baryons minus antibaryons was zero. And now we know this number is positive. So there must be some physical effect that can increase the baryon number in the universe. There used to be charge and charge parity violation. Charge symmetry is just the symmetry between matter and antimatter. That's a perfectly good symmetry. We won't end up with more of one than the other, obviously. And there needs to be charge parity symmetry violation uh, because the process that generates baryons needs to uh, occur more, more frequently than the process that generates antibaryons, which only get a phase CP symmetry violation. 
And finally, there has to be a deviation from thermal equilibrium. Uh, the net baryon number is by definition a constant if everything's in thermal equilibrium, so we need to deviate from that a little bit. And the question you could ask is, you know, does our current theory of particle physics does the standard model meet all three of these conditions? And the answer is yes, the standard model does contain uh, uh, processes that do all these three things. The problem is when we go ask a quantum field theorist what uh, ratio of baryon to photon number is predicted by the standard model, you get a number that's roughly 11 orders of magnitude too small. The standard model has all of these processes, uh, but it doesn't have enough of them. Uh, and in particular, uh, it's going to need some more CP violation. So let's take a look at what uh, CP violation actually is included in the standard model. Uh, the only CP, uh, the CP violation we know about that's non zero in the standard model is encoded in something called the CKM matrix. The CKM matrix tells you how quarks mix into one another, uh, as shown here. So you have uptight quarks on the right side and downtight quarks on the left side, shown uh, by their mass. And the heavier quarks can decay into the lighter quarks, uh, and they do so um, uh, given by uh, something called the CKM matrix. And the CKM matrix is a three by three matrix that sort of tells you how uh, the mass eigenstates of uh, the downtight quarks are different from the weak eigenstates. And because this uh, matrix has a uh, uh, complex components in it, uh, it violates CP symmetry. And this is a well understood part uh, of particle physics that I'm not terribly familiar with, but, but is well characterized by the people. The other place uh, the standard model could have CP violation, but it doesn't, is in the strong quarks. So there's a term in the Lagrangian you can write that looks like this uh, that would violate CP symmetry if the coefficients in private were not zero. Uh, but measurements of the neutron EDM, as well as measurements of the mercury EDM at the experiment at the University of Washington, it's at very stringent limits on the size of this parameter. We know it's very small. And this uh, led people thinking there must be some parameter making it small, and looking for uh, well, such as axion, and looking for, for dark matter like that. Uh, but as far as we know, uh, the, the, the certain, as we do know, the standard model doesn't violate CP violation very much, and that's sort of the rate limiting process here that leads to the, the, the theorists getting a small value uh, of the baryon to photon ratio in the standard model, which gives us strong evidence to think that there must be more CP violation beyond the standard model uh, to explain why there's so much more matter than anything else. And that's where our experiment comes in. What we do is we look for CP violation that's not included in the standard model. In particular, the way we do that is by looking to see if electrons have an electric dipole. So here's my cartoon picture of the electron. We know electrons have mass, they have a negative charge, uh, and they have a spin, which I'm showing here classically. Um, electrons are point particles and they're not actually spinning, but just for this slide, it's a, it's a pretty useful cartoon. And associated with that spin, electrons have a magnetic dipole moment. What we want to ask is what if electrons also have an electric dipole moment? And the way that I'm drawing that is I've dug a little bit of the charge out of the top and I stuck it down uh, on the bottom of the electron. And that's a linear uh, displacement of charge given the electron uh, non zero electric dipole The reason this would be interesting if electrons do have a non zero electric dipole is that it would violate time reversal symmetry. So the way you can picture this is if you imagine taking a video of an electron spinning uh, in this direction, you can play that video in reverse, and this, the electron will now be spinning the opposite way. So the spin flips when you do a time reversal symmetry operation. But the dipole moment of the electron will still be in the same direction. So there's still a little cavity at the top and still a little extra lump of charge at the bottom. The dipole moment of the electron points the same way. The reason uh, this is by the time reversal symmetry is because we know all electrons are identical with one another. You can exchange them and they behave like identical fermions. So if we go out in our lab and we measure that the dipole moment of electrons is parallel to their spin, you know that all electrons in the universe have that moment parallel to their spin, and somehow the universe uh, chose to make electrons that look like this, but no electrons that look like the one on the right. I've been talking about CP violation so far, and now on this slide I've been talking about time reversal symmetry violation. What I'm assuming uh, is that the combined charge parity and time reversal operations, when they all happen together, uh, are a good symmetry of matrix. Um, which is true in the standard model, and that's one of the linchpins that gives us uh, Lorentz and Bay. So if that's true, then time reversal symmetry violation implies the existence of CP symmetry violation, and I'll be using the two interchangeably for the rest of the talk. There are some beyond the standard model theories that violate CP symmetry, uh, but those are difficult to come about. So not only uh, would finding a non-zero electron EDM uh, uh, show us that there is time reversal symmetry violation in nature beyond the standard model predicts, uh, this is a particularly good place to look for CP violation for three reasons. Uh, the first, as I'll be telling you about throughout the rest of the talk, um, is that we're, we're pretty good as a field of actually measuring the electron EDM. 
But in addition to that, it's a background free measurement and it's a natural place for time reversal symmetry violation to show up uh, and beyond the standard model theories by generating an electron EDM. So first I'll talk about this point up here, why the electron EDM is a background free measurement. If you want uh, the standard model to generate an electron electric dipole moment, you need to draw a Feynman diagram that starts with an electron, some virtual particles in the middle, and ends with an electron. And these virtual particles in the middle need to violate, have interactions that violate CP symmetry. Like I told you before, the only place that has non zero CP symmetry violation in the standard model is the weak interaction when uh, up type work and uh, fixes into a down type work. So, what's happening here is we have an electron that turns into a W boson on an electron neutrino. That W boson turns into a down type quark and an anti up type quark. And at this vertex, you get an element of the CKM matrix. So, in principle, uh, this is the simplest kind of uh, uh, Feynman diagram that you can draw that could lead to an electron electric dipole moment. The problem, though, is that this uh, vertex is going to give you uh, one contribution from the CKM matrix. And this uh, vertex on the other side is going to give you the complex conjugate of that same matrix element. Those get multiplied together. And you get something that's completely real and doesn't lead to any uh, CP symmetry violation in a simple kind of Feynman diagram, just a second order like this. You can make your life more complicated and go to third order, where now we have quarks turning into other quarks and then eventually back into an electron. And each one of these individual Feynman diagrams is going to, on its own, lead to an electron electric dipole moment. But it happens that when you sum all of them up, uh, you get a contribution of the EDM that's equal to zero at third order. So you have to go all the way to fourth order, and there are two ways to go to fourth order. You can either include a strong interaction between two different quarks inside of your Feynman diagram, or just by going to fourth order in the electroweak theory. Either one of these, uh, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you add up all these Feynman diagrams, you end up getting an electron electric dipole moment that's about 10 to the minus 36 electron centimeters. Uh, that's fortunately a very small number compared to the experimental sensitivity of the electron EDM. The previous best result of the electron EDM was done by the Acme collaboration, uh, which Dave Janelle is a, a part of. Um, and they put a limit that's about seven orders of magnitude larger uh, than the, the standard model macro. So we think we did a better job than the Acme collaboration. We have a, a smaller uncertainty than they do, but we certainly don't have seven orders of magnitude better sensitivity to the EDM than they do. And what that means is that we measure a non-zero EDM, that's either definitive evidence of physics beyond the standard model, or it means that I messed up the system. So it's, it's, it's one of the two, and I really hope it's not the same. So I want to contrast this really complicated looking Feynman diagram you get from the standard model that generates uh, an electric dipole moment to this much simpler looking Feynman diagram of how beyond the standard model physics could possibly lead to an electron EDM. So I'm using supersymmetry as an example here. So this is a generic feature of uh, beyond the standard model physics, uh, of, of many theories beyond the standard model, where you can get an electron EDM just at one loop. So we have an electron coupling to some new particle. In this example, it's the supersymmetric partner of the electron with coupling strength G. This interaction occurs uh, uh, in, in a way that violates uh, CP symmetry, is given by this sine phi CP, which ranges from zero to one. If it's one, it maximally violates CP symmetry. If it's zero, it doesn't at all. And then it, of course, couples back to the electron. And the nice thing about this simple kind of Feynman diagram is that you can uh, calculate how large of an electric dipole moment uh, this would generate. So uh, just, it's just with this expression here, this first term is a charge times the distance, giving you the right units uh, of the electron EDM. It's multiplied by G squared, uh, which is the coupling string squared for context uh, in uh, uh, quantum electrodynamics, G squared is equal to alpha, one over 137. It's multiplied by how much it violates time reversal symmetry, because only the part of this interaction that violates time reversal symmetry leads to an EDM. And then generically, the size of the electron EDM is proportional to one divided by the mass uh, of the new particle squared. So you can take this equation, uh, you can also take the previous measurement of the EDM done by the Acme collaboration. And what I'm going to assert are natural assumptions. So if you assume uh, that the coupling strength of the new beyond the standard model physics is about the same size as uh, the quantum electrodynamics, so you get a factor of alpha there. You assume this new physics, which uh, the whole point of the beyond the standard model physics is to explain why there's more matter than antimatter, or at least that's another one. Uh, so you'd expect that these uh, new interactions violate CP symmetries uh, almost completely. Um, and also, if these uh, new interactions couple to the electron just at first order, what you get for, for those specific kinds uh, of interactions is that the 2018 result has already ruled out particles that are about twice as heavy that can be created at the water type of water. So I think this is a really exciting uh, place in the field to be, where improvements on uh, even measuring a null result, the electron EDM, starts to rule out heavier and heavier particles 
uh, uh, though only particles that satisfy the conditions I mentioned earlier, which couple the electron at first order, violate time reversal symmetry, and have a comparable to uh, uh, final angular energies. So here on this screen, I have the size of the electric dipole moment as predicted by a number of different theories. Here on the left, we have small values of the EDM, uh, such as the one predicted by the standard model, which makes sense because it doesn't violate time versus symmetry very much, but it's a small value of the EDM. And these in green, we have these beyond the standard model theories that uh, predict larger values of the EDM uh, and also have enough time versus symmetry to explain why there's more matter than antimatter in the universe. Overlaid on this now, I have uh, previous experiments of the electrons and electric dipole moment. Um, I like to include this one here uh, from Amherst in 1989. So it was done by my undergraduate advisor at a small liberal arts school without much in the way of funding or any grad students. So I think it's pretty cool that we got on here. Um, and as you can see, up through 2002, uh, the, the, the ex uh, experimental limits were mostly set by an experiment at Berkeley uh, done by Eugene Cummins with uh, Valium Meadows. Um, and the uh, field sort of took a break there because it was, it was really hard to get past what uh, uh, Eugene Cummins accomplished uh, in an atom experiment until eventually in 2010, uh, there was a new limit set by the field switching to diatomic molecules. This was set uh, at Imperial College using the deuterium chloride molecules. And since then, there's been a real takeoff in terms of how far we've been able to reduce the limit on the electron's electric dipole moment uh, by using these diatomic molecules. So the ACME experiment, which is the experiment uh, Dave Jamel works on, uses thorium oxide molecules, and our Jillo experiment uh, uses hafnium chloride plus molecular ion. You can overlap the progress on ruling out electron electric dipole moments to the progress on, again, with all the same caveats I mentioned previously on the mass reach uh, of these experiments. You can see that two orders of magnitude progress in terms of EDM is one order of magnitude progress in ruling out these heavier particles. But again, we're at this really exciting point where we're starting to rule things out uh, uh, heavier than uh, uh, what can be made for large hadron colliders. So the colliders would come in like that one one to ten TeV in there. Yeah. So the so the, the central you know the, they 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 say thirteen TeV a lot. And when you look at what limits they can actually rule out, they're normally between one and three TeV depending on the model. Yeah. Um, although uh, they one of the the uh, uh, reasons they're trying to do the higher luminosity run is that that'll that number will, will start to approach uh, thirteen TeV, but it won't quite get there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they're they're somewhere in this region, but they can roll out by by observing them directly. Yeah, those uh, theoretical limits have been changing continuously since about nineteen eighty nine or so. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah no, I, the I, 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 experiments I, come down. But yeah, I, I saw I saw down. the very Hunter made made a similar plot in nineteen eighty nine, and and you know what he predicted for where the EDM should be was somewhere in here, and now like these green yeah, boxes moved over and, downward. Yeah, and you know the farther we pushed, the more green and clear will fill out this region in the graph. But, uh, just fair enough because this is about as far as they can go with those theories. And after that, it's pretty much over. Right, and so that, that that's another reason why it's uh, uh, exciting in the field now, because hopefully they 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 think that you know if, if one of these theories is right, we got to see it soon. Um, so for the next, uh, this is sort of the, the end of my theoretical introduction. So if there are any other questions on this part now, might be a good time to ask. Is there a meaning to how high the bars go? Yeah, it's just proportional to the time. I, I don't oh, know. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, I spent an embarrassing amount of time in mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, what about this technical work? Oh, yeah. If you want me to explain what any of these beyond the standard model physics theories are, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm an experimental AMO. Uh, That's Tom uh, Alphalus <laughs> invention. He's right here on campus. You can ask him. And the width of the box means the error bar, or why? The, the, the width of the box means, you know, the the you know they they don't they don't they don't ever tell you what value of the EDM they're actually going to predict. They give you like a range of how big they think it should be, and then when you rule out most of one of their boxes, they they sometimes extend the box farther than why. So it's uh, it's a moving target. I have a question on one of your previous slides, but you said that there are three categories. Uh, after of came up with it, and simply violation is the place where people look for this uh, asymmetry thing. Yeah. And what's the reason behind? Yeah, so so I um, might not have made this clear, but the, when when you do the calculations and you get a small number, you can sort of see like uh, 
uh, and the way I think of it's like there's like a rate limiting constant, like what, what number, like what do they not have enough of these four ingredients to get a larger number? And the easiest way to get a larger number is just dumping in a bit more CP violation. Um, so you're saying I would have to dump in a lot more C violation. I, I, I don't claim to fully understand how these calculations work, but the takeaway that the theorists have is when they do these calculations is that they, they um, strongly suspect that maybe even need there to be more CP violation that exists. So this is, this is the one of the four links that uh, the standard model is. But I, I, I can't. Quantify that statement incredibly well. Okay, another quick question. Uh, apart from this asymmetry, what is the other motivation to think that there is a solution? Is uh, there one? Um, we, we, we need us to be here. Uh, yeah, there needs to be more matter. Than, there, there is more matter than it's matter in the universe. Uh, and so they, there, there should be more time to speak about it. That's, uh, That's the one thing. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there's these new beyond the standard model particles that can couple to it. So you could say big stories about dark matter, but this is this is what I would stand on. Yeah. Okay, great. So hopefully I motivated you uh, to think that measuring the electrons electric back moment is worth, uh, worth doing. So how do you? How do you actually do it? Here against my cartoon of what an uh, electric dipole moment looks like, and in the absence of any external electric or magnetic fields, the spin up and spin down states of an electron are degenerate. There's no uh, energy difference between the two. If we apply a magnetic field, we know that the spin up and spin down states split from each other based on how large the uh, magnetic dipole moment of the electron is. If you want, you can measure uh, that energy difference by applying a frequency to cause the electrons to split from the down spin state to the up spin state. And measure what frequency uh, causes the electrons to, to, to switch states. You could then repeat this experiment in the presence of an electric field. If the electrons do have a non zero electric type moment, the energy will shift in one direction for a given direction of the electric field. And then you can reverse the direction of the electric field uh, and measure the energy difference between those two experimental sets of data. And that energy difference is going to be proportional to the electric field that you've applied multiplied by the size of the electrons electric type. The idea, though, is to measure the electron's electric back moment as carefully as you possibly can. So how can you reduce uh, the uncertainty on the electron's EDM? Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to apply as large an electric field as you possibly can, because that'll split the two peaks farther and farther apart. You want a long coherence time. You want the electron to be in the presence of these electric and magnetic fields for as long as possible, because that'll narrow the data you collect in frequency space. And you want a large count rate. You want to uh, be able to run the experiment many times in parallel or hire graduate students to take many hundreds of hours of data in order to increase uh, the statistics you have on each of these two gas units. You put it together, you find the uncertainty on the electron EDM is proportional to one divided by the effective electric field, uh, tau the coherence time, and square root of measurements that you end up making. So this is sort of the figure of merit for these EDM experiments. And you want to make these three values as large as possible. How do we try to accomplish this agila? What we do is we use a um, polar molecule, hafnium chloride plus. Hafnium chloride has a large effective electric field between its hafnium nucleus and chlorine nucleus. Uh, the effective electric fields in these polar molecules are order tens of gigavolts per centimeter. That's about 100,000 times larger than an electric field you can make in a lab, whether you try to do it safely or not. Uh, so that's why the field in the last decade or so has switched to these polar molecules. Isn't that, that have to break down of air? Uh, yeah, no, it's not. Yeah, it's, like field, it's, it's, it's not like a real electric field. It's what the electron experiences, and uh, yeah, so it's it's uh, but 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 it's it's much larger than you can actually produce if this were uh, an actual electric field. You also want uh, long coherence times. The way to do that is we use a, a charged species of uh, molecular ion. So happening in chloride plus, we can hold on to an, um, an ion trap for arbitrarily long times. Um, and you want uh, to increase the square root of n, so we trap tens of thousands of these half moon chloride molecules all together. I think it's interesting to compare uh, our approach to how we improve this figure of merit to the ACME experiment. So ACME also uses a polar molecule that has a large effective electric field. They use a, a molecular beam of ions that travels from one side of a three-ish meter long chamber to the other. Uh, it takes about three milliseconds or so for it to go from one side to the other, so their coherence time is about a factor of a thousand times shorter than ours. We are able to get coherence times of about three seconds. Uh, but they're able to get something like a million times more particles because they have these neutral particles in the beam that they've tried to get as many particles go from one side to the other. 
uh, which I think is really good for the field because you need independent experiments to check each other, and these totally different approaches will have different systematic areas. So how does the experiment actually work? We start with a neutral beam of hafnium fluoride molecules that flies through our ion trap. When the molecules reach the center, we turn on our pulse ionization lasers that kick off one of the electrons from the hafnium fluoride to make hafnium fluoride plus. And at the same time, we apply a pulse of voltage to stop the velocity of the ions and turn on our pull trap to trap the molecules in the center. They have trapping frequencies of roughly one kilohertz in all three dimensions, and they're able to trap something like 20,000 of them at a time. What I told you earlier, though, in order to do an electric dipole moment experiment is that we need the effective electric field that the, uh, the molecules are experiencing to line up with a magnetic field and have those fields be parallel and anti-parallel to one another inside of our ion trap. When you trap uh, uh, these molecules inside of a pull trap, their electric fields are going to be pointing any which direction. They don't have a preferred axis for them to point on, really. So what you want to do is you want to line up all these molecules. And these molecules have large molecular dipole moments. There's a positive charge on one end and a negative charge on the other. So if you put them inside of an electric field, the molecules are going to line up in a particular direction. So that would be great, but then you remember their charged particles, and if you do that, they'll fly out of your trap. What we do instead is we apply a rotating electric field of uh, these parameters here. It's the electric field, the, the magnitude of this rotating electric field is large compared to the electric field they see from the ball trap. And the frequency is fast compared to the, the, the secular frequency of the, the molecules. What that means is the molecules are going to rotate in little circles according to this electric field with a radius of about half a millimeter. And so now we have the effective electric field, which points from the hafnium to the fluorine, lined up inside of this rotating frame. And we can apply a magnetic field that co rotates parallel and anti parallel uh, to this rotating electric field. I'm going to skip a whole bunch of steps now. When you first ionize and trap the molecules inside of this rotating electric field, they start in the ground state, which is a single sigma state. For those of you familiar with molecular notation, it's a lot like a 1s state if you're more familiar with the atomic notation. You want to do the experiment in this triple delta 1 state, which is like a 3d1 state. Um, and that's a metastable state with a lifetime uh, of about two seconds. So what we have to do is use a combination of microwaves and lasers to move as many of the molecules as we can into this electronic state. Molecules are more complicated than atoms. Not only do they have uh, electronic states and hyperfine structure, but they also can vibrate and they can rotate. So you get more atomic numbers for that. And we want to work in the ground vibrational state and ground rotational state in this particular hyperfine state that I'm showing you here. And this is what the energy structure of this state looks like uh, inside of our rotating electric field. The important part, and I'm going to focus on these two doublets, the upper doublet, which is these two states up here, and the lower doublet, these two states down here, they're split from each other by about 100 megahertz in energy. And that's purely because the molecular dipole moment of the ion is pointing opposite directions inside of an electric field. So the, the dipole wants to line up a certain way, and there's an energy cost to line up the opposite way. I mentioned we also apply a rotating magnetic field. And now in the frame uh, of the, in this rotating frame, where, we, uh, uh, where we're looking at the quantum states of the molecule, this rotating magnetic field will cause diagonal Zeeman shift. So it will cause these M sub F equals plus three half states to shift up just a little bit, about 100 hertz, or about 50 hertz up. Uh, and these minus three, some half, uh, three half states will shift about 50 hertz down, causing roughly 100 hertz difference in the upper state and the lower state. This is similar to what I told you about earlier. We've so far applied a magnetic field to our, uh, our, our particles, and we have some frequency you can measure uh, between uh, in the upper doublet and in the lower doublet. What we really want is information about the electron's electric at the moment. Now, the nice part of these two states is that because the molecules are pointing in opposite directions, the electric fields are also pointing in opposite directions. So up here, you have an electric field going parallel to your magnetic field. And down here, your electric field is pointing anti-parallel to the magnetic field. And that's exactly what you want in order to measure the electron's electric dipole moment. These two states are like the uh, same magnetic shift, but uh, pushed up to this one up here, and the same magnetic shift pushed down down here. And if you measure both of these frequencies as accurately as you can, and then take the difference between them, you'll read out the electron's electric dipole moment. If you're uh, carefully paying attention, there's a U here and an L here. These G factors are slightly different, so it's not quite that simple, but I'll get to how we uh, get rid of the magnetic information in a few slides. What we want to do now is we want to measure the frequency in this upper doublet and the frequency of this lower doublet as carefully as we can. And to do that, we do Ramsey anthropometry. So to make things simple, I'll just focus on how we do the measurement uh, in the upper state, and then we can do all of this simultaneously in the lower state, which is a really nice feature. And we start with all the molecules pumped into this stretch state, the plus three half state. 
if you're familiar with the block sphere, uh, you probably know it's going on here in the interferometry already. But the idea is we start with all the molecules of this plus three half C, uh, and you can represent that by a vector pointing vertically up along the block sphere. So if uh, you have a vector pointing up, uh, the molecules are just in the plus three half state. If it's pointing down, they're just in this minus three half state. And if they're pointing somewhere in the middle, it's going to be in the superposition of these two states. So we start with the vector pointing up. We now apply a pi over two pulse. Uh, which generates a superposition of these two states, and that's uh, equivalent to doing a 90 degree rotation around the y axis. So it uh, points the molecule, the, the, the vector pointing up, pointing down in the xy plane. And then in the xy plane, what the information being reported uh, by what, uh, as a neutral angle you're pointing around, is what the phase is of the superposition of these two states. So, say uh, over here you have a plus superposition. So, this state, and when the vector is pointing this way, is three halves plus uh, minus three halves state. When molecules are in a superposition of two, or when any quantum system is in a superposition of two different states with an energy difference between them, the relative phase will evolve at exactly the frequency uh, of that energy difference. Um, what that looks like is it looks like a uh, rotation around the z-axis uh, at a frequency given by the energy difference at about 100 hertz for our experiment. You can then uh, hold the molecules in this superposition for a variable Ramsey time, which we call capital T. And if the vector is rotated all the way around to this side, we do our second pi over two pulse. It's again a 90 degree rotation around the y axis. That'll cause the molecules to rotate up, and the molecules will go from being in the superposition up here, all the molecules being on this side. If we wait a little bit longer for the molecules to process around and then do the pi over two pulse, we'll end up down here, and we'll see all the molecules on this side. And we can vary the amount of time. We can end up mapping the phase accumulated due to the energy difference into a population difference between the plus three halves and minus three halves state. So we do our second uh, pi over two pulse. We, uh, in this example I show, most of the populations end up in the minus three half state while some of it's in the plus three half state. What we'd love to do is we'd love to measure the population on both sides uh, in the plus three half and minus three half. So we can see uh, what percentage of the population is on which side because that'll tell us uh, how much phase has been accumulated and what the frequency is. But unfortunately, we're not able to do that. So we turn on a laser to pick these molecules out from uh, our experiment. And we measure the amount of population in this plus three half state. Uh, we can then do that again, do the entire experiment over, but measure the molecules in this minus three half state. And what we do that for a particular Ramsey time is we can see how much the population is in the plus three halves versus in the minus three halves. So here in the upper doublet, an asymmetry of zero means we have the same amount of population on the two sides. If you wait a little bit, the population will go into, say, the plus three half state. If you wait longer, it'll move down into this minus three half state. And we can watch this oscillation go on for uh, in this data set uh, one and a half seconds, but all the way up to three seconds and some of the data we've taken. And we measure the frequency the molecules are sloshing back and forth at, which is exactly the frequency given by this energy difference. The cool thing about this is we can measure simultaneously the, the, the population in this plus three half state in the upper doublet and the plus three half state in the lower doublet. So every time we take a data point that goes into what uh, the asymmetry is on one of these graphs, we take a simultaneous one for the other graph. And that's really nice because if there's any uh, stray magnetic fields causing weird frequency perception oscillation, that'll uh, affect the upper doublet and lower doublet simultaneously. And we're interested in the difference frequency, so we can subtract those effects out. And that helps us uh, get much closer to the uh, uh, quantum noise pool. So you end up taking uh, that data and a bunch of different experimental configurations. Uh, I talked about how we take data in the upper doublet and the lower doublet, we do that simultaneously. We also want to take data with the magnetic field pointing parallel and anti-parallel to the electric field. We can have our electric field rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. And we have two other chops that we do as well, but just to focus on how we end up extracting the EDM data, let's just worry about the upper doublet and lower doublet, as well as the magnetic field parallel and anti parallel to the electric field. If you take one linear combination uh, of the data you take, you add these two frequencies, you subtract these two frequencies, and you divide by four, which I didn't bother including, what you get is the, the average Zabon frequency of both the upper and lower doublet, which is roughly 100 hertz. You can take an orthogonal linear combination to find the difference of the Zeeman frequency for the upper and lower doublet. Delta G is equal to the difference of the G factor in the upper state and uh, the lower state. Uh, and that uh, frequency channels uh, 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 makes uh, simultaneous measurement. And this uh, difference frequency is about uh, 500 times smaller, so about 200 millihertz of uh, uh, Zeeman uh, oscillation you see in this channel. And finally, you can take a third orthogonal linear combination which doesn't include any of the magnetic fields, but just includes the effect from the electron's electric bed moment. And this works because the frequencies due to the magnetic field change sign when you flip uh, the direction of the magnetic relative to the electric field, but the electron's electric back moment doesn't. 
So just by looking at this one uh, linear combination of the frequencies we measure, we can back out the electrons one and that one. Then what you do is you take all of these different linear uh, experimental chunks. Uh, you take all the different ways you can take the data um, at early time and late time, and you measure the frequencies. You put, uh, when you do all those uh, measurements, that takes roughly 20 or 30 minutes, and you call that data set a block. From each block, we get one value of FDD, which tells us about the electron electric dipole moment. And then if you take about 600 total hours of data, you can plot all of this data you take in of the frequency channel you care about of FDD, uh, on a plot like this. And so what this is showing you is uh, it's showing you uh, the central value that we measure of FDB for each block. We assign an uncertainty to each of those measurements of the frequency that tells us about the EDM. Uh, and then this is showing you how far away each of those measurements are from the mean value of our entire data set. So we still don't know the central value of the, the data we measured at this point. But what you hope for is that this looks like a nice Gaussian distribution of the data we measure. Uh, and it does, chi squared is very close to one, which tells you you don't have to partly, artificially inflate uh, the error bars we, we, we give to each of uh, these blocks. Uh, and that gives you the, the, the width of the, of the Gaussian. And what you find is that the total statistical uncertainty on the EDM is about 23 microns. So this is great, but it's actually the easy part of the experiment. You can always just take more and more data to reduce uh, the uncertainty on what the central value uh, of this uh, statistical data set is the hard part of doing an EDM experiment or any of these precision measurements for precision measurement experiments is to uh, understand and make sure your systematic error bar is as small as possible. So that's what I want to talk about uh, for most of the rest of the time. So one way we can get uh, systematic error is from Barry's phase. Um, I didn't have a great grasp of what Barry's phase was after I took bottom two here. So I'll try to do my best uh, explanation of it uh, on my own really quick. So various phase is a geometric and entirely classical effect. Uh, you can see that by just uh, uh, rotating your, your finger around. So if my, my uh, pointer finger is the quantization axis, my thumb can tell me what the phase is. And basically the idea is if I move my arm down, I rotate it around and I bring back up, my thumb's now rotated about 90 degrees. And uh, so you get a phase rotation uh, of, uh, of uh, that's proportional to the solid angle that you employs. This is exactly what's happening in quantum mechanics, except when you have just one state with its quantization axis moving around, uh, you pick up an overall phase, and that's not terribly interesting. Uh, but what Barry figured out, I think, in the 1980s, uh, is that this is an actually observable effect if you uh, have a quantum state that's in a superposition of two states, and has uh, those two states have different values of m sub f. So the relative phase between the two states uh, is proportional to what m sub f is, um, and you get a relative phase uh, yeah, that's, that's resistance equal to what you see here. If instead of just going around one closed loop, like I showed you here, you keep going around that loop at a constant rate, uh, phase that you pick up at a constant rate is by definition a frequency. So instead of just a various phase, you get a various frequency. And that various frequency is going to be the various phase you pick up divided by 2 pi multiplied by uh, the frequency at which you're, you're, you're rotating around uh, this solid angle. In our experiment, we're not rotating around a relatively small solid angle, which is the normal way to think about various phases. What we're doing instead is we're doing rotations in the entire xy plane. So we have our electric field here, and in a perfect world, it wouldn't point up in the z direction at all, but you would rotate it around in the xy and not have any uh, part of the electric field, which is a quantization axis in our experiment, pointing in the vertical direction. In our case, uh, because we're in a superposition of plus three halves and minus three half states, delta m sub f is equal to three. And when you rotate around uh, in a perfect circle here, you pick up a solid angle of 2 pi each time you go around in a circle, which means every time we go around in a circle, which we do uh, once uh, with a frequency of 375 kilohertz, you pick up a various phase of 6 pi. Phases are defined modulo 2 pi, so if you pick up exactly a various phase of 6 pi, you pick up the various phase of 0, and you don't have to worry about that. So what do you mean is various phase? Is this just the rotating frame? Uh, so, I'm sorry, say again? The rotating frame, you're working in a rotating frame. Yeah, we're. You really don't need very space if you work in such a standard person that so, Mars. You so, we, 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 we do the spectroscopy in a rotating frame, but we can still see very space in mm -hmm. I don't. So, there's something else. So 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 this isn't this isn't uh, like the the rotating frame like the rotating wave approximation. This is this is actually yeah, like this is a real uh, yeah. physical field rotating, but. 
yeah. Anyway, it's interesting. Well, sorry for interrupting. No, sorry, Stan. <laughs> um, great. So if we were to take perfectly in the XY plane, there's no tilt to the electric field. Uh, you pick up a solid angle of 2 pi each time you go around, and you don't see any physical effect. Uh, what could happen, though, is none of your experiments you do in a lab are going to be perfect. What if there's some angle tilting the electric field up just a little bit? As you rotate around in the xy plane, uh, the solid angle you're going to enclose now is just a little bit smaller than 2 pi. Uh, and it's going to be 2 pi minus uh, uh, something multiplied by the angle that you're tilted up at. And then the solid angle you enclose is defined whether you rotate around clockwise or counterclockwise. This r tilde is just positive one or negative one, depending on which way you're going around in your rotation. This term here is still six pi. It still drops out because phase is mod defined uh, define mod two pi. But you do get this uh, additional bearing space from having any imperfection in your experiment with the molecules not rotating perfectly in the x y plane. This uh, bearing space can turn into a various frequency by the same uh, map I showed you earlier. And what you get is you get a one megahertz effect multiplied by the small angle that's going to be different, uh, have a different sign, whether you're rotating clockwise or counterclockwise. But the scary thing is you see a very space uh, that's ordered uh, 11 orders of magnitude larger than what you want to measure. Now, we want to tell you something about the electron and electric dipole moment, not something well understood about very space and claim it's a new beyond the standard model result. So uh, when you first see this, you might think, oh, we need to control our the angle that the uh, electric fields tilting to 11 orders of magnitude, and that sounds impossible. Um, fortunately, it's not quite that bad. In fact, the only way you can get uh, this average angle of pointing uh, tilting up is uh, due to the effect of gravity, and that's because we work in an ion trap. We know that on average, uh, the electric field the molecules experience is, uh, or the total force the molecules experience is equal to zero. Um, so the only way you can have a static electric field pointing up, which tilts the direction of your quantization axis, is due to the electric field that balances against gravity. Unfortunately, we're working with molecules. Those are pretty small. This is a problem you could uh, give to an undergrad, uh, probably first year uh, physics student, and this in terms of adding vectors and seeing what the angle is between the two of them. And what you find is while this angle is small, it's not 10 to the minus 11. Uh, in fact, you get a very space uh, of 4 hertz just from the fact that the molecules have a mass and there's uh, uh, the electric field that has to balance out gravity. Fortunately, though, this doesn't sabotage the experiment. And that's because we take data uh, with molecules rotating clockwise and molecules rotating counterclockwise. The electric dipole moment shouldn't care which direction the molecules are rotating. So the linear combination of frequencies we measure uh, to read out the electron's electric dipole moment averages between uh, clockwise and counterclockwise, and that should make the effect go to zero. And also this very space effect should uh, affect the upper doublet and lower doublet are exactly the same. And because we're taking the difference between the frequency we measure in the upper doublet and the frequency we measure in the lower doublet, any effect that manages to make it through the fact that we uh, imperfectly, uh, uh, you know, we, rotate, we try to rotate perfectly clockwise and perfectly counterclockwise, if there's any experimental imperfection in that, that should still apply equally to the upper double and lower double. So we actually don't include this effect into our system now. There are other ways to generate very space, though, not just by having a static electric field. You still need to have something to tilt the uh, quantization axis out of the xy plane. So you need a field uh, in the z direction. That means there, of course, can be oscillating electric fields in the z direction. So uh, this uh, is a perfectly possible uh, electric field the molecules could be experiencing. This is the electric field in the x, y, and z components. The first two are just the rotating electric field, uh, rotating either clockwise or counterclockwise. That's what this r tilt is telling you. Uh, at a frequency of 375 kilohertz. You can imagine that we're generating a whole lot of 375 kilohertz voltage uh, oscillating to make um, uh, the rotating electric field. We're using op amps to do that. Op amps generate higher harmonics, and maybe there's something that causes an electric field to point along the z direction at twice uh, the frequency of rotation. So what does that look like? We have our electric field rotating around in the xy plane, and twice as frequently it's oscillating up and down at z. And what you can do is you can go to Mathematica and wildly exaggerate the effect uh, to see if you get an average various phase angle that's pointing up more than it's pointing down. What you see, though, is that the angle of the electric field is pointing up just as often. So while you go over one rotation, if this is all that's happening to the experiment, you get a various phase that's exactly uh, equal to zero over one rotation. As frequently happens, though, uh, it's not one thing going wrong in an experiment that leads to a systematic. It's two things going wrong together. And what you can imagine is that in addition to this uh, electric field oscillating in the z direction, the electric field in the xy plane is not a perfect circle. It has some elasticity, and that's bound to happen because 
I know you can draw a perfect circle and factors anyway. So what's happening is the electric field is bigger when it points along y and smaller when it points along x, and we're still getting this oscillation along z at twice the frequency of this frequency. You can plug that into Mathematica, and what you see uh, immediately uh, is that the angle uh, when the electric field is pointing up, uh, the, the electric field ends up pointing up a lot more than it ends up pointing down. The average angle when you integrate over this rotation uh, is positive, and that's just going to depend on the phase uh, of the second harmonic oscillating in Z relative to the elasticity. It could either be positive or negative, depending on how you put it together. But in general, this can give you a non-zero uh, various phase that actually can lead to a systematic error. This does leak into our uh, EDM channel, which is the FDB. Um, and then you go through and you plug through the map, what you find is that you get a four kilohertz shift multiplied by these two uh, dimensionless numbers. And so these numbers are the magnitude of the field oscillating in the Z dimension divided by the magnitude of the field rotating in the XY plane, multiplied by the magnitude of the ellipticity divided by the uh, same electric field in the plane. So what we have to do now is we have to go uh, and measure how large these two uh, uh, dimensionless numbers are in our experiment and hope that the total systematic shift is going to be small compared uh, to 23 megahertz at the end of the day. The way we do that is the first thing we can do is we can purposely apply a large second harmonic in the Z dimension and a large ellipticity to make sure we actually see the effect we expect, which we did. And then the next thing we can do is we can apply a large second harmonic in the Z dimension, uh, but not apply any ellipticity, try to apply a perfect uh, rotating circle. And what we find, because we still see the effect, uh, we can we can measure the size of the ellipticity of our circle, which is about three times 10 to minus the board. You can do the same thing where you apply a large ellipticity and you turn off the second harmonic. And in that case, we weren't able to see an effect anymore. So we were only able to set an upper limit on how large the second harmonic in our experiment actually is. And we get about two to the minus, uh, two times 10 to the minus six. When you put these numbers together and you multiply them, uh, fortunately, you get a number that's smaller uh, than the 23 microhertz shift. And that's partly because when we first did the, the measurement, we were able to use this as a tool to, to reduce the ellipticity uh, in our trap as best as our electrons would let us. So, this is one example of a systematic error. This is uh, the table I've been working on for the past few years of uh, quantifying what all the systematic errors in the experiments look like. Uh, the axial second harmonic and the ellipticity of ERA give you a various phase that gives you a two megahertz uncertainty. You go through and you measure all of these uh, uh, systematics by uh, thinking of as many uh, ways you can get a systematic error in your experiment as you possibly can, uh, measuring and quantifying how large those are, and also just by applying like random magnetic or electric field and seeing what that does to the experiment and trying to quantify uh, uh, what's going on to make sure you understand as best you can what's happening in the measurement. What we find at the end of the day is you get an uncertainty by adding all these in quadrature of about seven microhertz. What we're left with is we're left with a frequency of statistical and systematic error bar. And we did all of this analysis without actually looking at what the frequency we measured was. It was blind the entire time. Uh, so I couldn't bias it towards zero. So I would take less heat when I go around and give talks. And Eric couldn't bias it away from zero. So we could win a second Nobel Prize. Uh, at the end of the day, what we find in these units uh, is that the frequency we measure is about one sigma or half a sigma away uh, from zero. We can convert this frequency uh, into the size of the electron's electric dipole moment, uh, which again, obviously, is uh, less than one sigma away from zero. And we can be 90% confident that the size of the electron EDM uh, is smaller than four times 10 to the minus 30 electron centimeters. We can compare that with the ACME result. ACME in these units measured approximately four plus or minus four. And we measured something like negative one plus or minus two. Uh, so because we had uh, about half the size error bar as they did, and we got lucky and got closer to zero, we can set roughly a 2.4 times smaller limit on the size of the electrons. So here uh, on this plot, I can now add the Vigila 2022 result. And because I made the plot, I can make the plot here bigger. Um, and you can convert uh, ruling out the, a little bit more of the state space into setting a, a more stringent limit on these uh, massive particles from beyond the standard model, where with all the same uh, caveats and natural assumptions that I made earlier, uh, we can rule out particles uh, that are at about the 40 terawatt on full level. So before uh, I wrap up, and I'm almost done, I just want to tell you really quickly about what we plan to do for our third generation measurement. Uh, again, here's our figure of merit for how to measure the electrons EDM. What you want to do is you want to make these three quantities as large as possible. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to switch from uh, hafnium fluoride molecules to thorium fluoride molecules. You get about a factor of one and a half gain in the size of the effective electric field, which is great. 
Uh, and hacking it before, I, had, I mentioned the triple delta one state we do the measurement in, it's a metastable state. It only has a lifetime of about two seconds. Uh, the nice thing about thorium fluoride is that the ground state there is the triple delta one state. So the molecules in principle can live there forever. In practice, what we expect that to be limited by is that black body radiation at the United Kelvin can excite a vibrational transition and ruin your superposition. So we'll want to cool down the entire apparatus to something like 150 Kelvin. Um, and hopefully that's going to be able to accept a lifetime after about 10 or 20 seconds. And finally, instead of doing the experiment in just a single ion trap, you want to multiplex how to do the experiment and what Eric's called the bucket brigade. So the idea is you uh, make your beam of thorium fluoride molecules, you come down here, you do your ionization, you prepare the molecules in the quantum state you want, you do the superposition, and you start waiting for a Ramsey time capital T. But instead of letting the molecules sit here and then reading out at the very end, you slowly move the molecules down along this three meter long region. Once the molecules have moved down far enough, you can start to make a new uh, bucket of uh, ions and you can form this whole assembly line of molecules moving from one end uh, down to the other with this cool region in the middle that will reduce the black body radiation the molecules see to let them live uh, for a super position of hopefully up to 20 seconds. And this uh, hopefully can substantially increase uh, the number of ions we measure uh, in a given hour of graduate students taking data and hopefully get uh, up to a factor of 10 improvement in the electrons like we said. So this would be a purely electrical conveyor belt where you would have segmented traps or something? Yeah, so segment and pull traps uh, going all the way down. Um, and so yeah, that is uh, what we're looking towards next. Uh, actually, generation three might be a scaled down version of this, and this could turn into generation four. We're having conversations about that now. Um, but that's where the uh, experiment is going. And with that, thank you uh, for listening to my talk. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, we have time for some questions. So, does anybody have any questions? How do you measure those grams? How do we count how many molecules are on one side of the frame? Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't. I didn't get into this. Uh, so I thought a lot of you would be interested in the, the particle physics part of it. Um, so we we end up with molecules in in the plus three half state uh, here. And molecules in the minus three have state here, and we want to measure them simultaneously, actually, right? So uh, what we do is uh, they're, they're they're pointing opposite directions, but really they're overlapping the same trap from each other. So we uh, do something called uh, we we I forget the fancy term for it, but basically we dissociate the molecules in a way that preserves their orientation. So the molecules that are in this state, the hafnium flies this way, and the fluorine flies that way. And the hafnium flies this way, and the fluorine flies that way. So uh, it turns into hafnium plus a neutral fluorine. Neutral fluorine atoms fall out of the trap, it's an ion trap. Uh, but we have uh, two spatially separated hafnium clouds. We want to measure how many uh, hafnium have gone this way and how many hafnium have gone that way. So what we do is we turn on an electric field and we move all the molecules in the whole trap, uh, all, 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 all the ions in the whole trap towards uh, an MCP, basically a camera. Uh, and because the hafnium are lighter than the hafnium fluoride, the hafnium are going to show up on the MCP before the whole, all the hafnium fluoride molecules that don't end up participating in the experiment with. So they'll be separated in the time of flight. And basically, we count how many molecules are on one side, or how many pixels light up on one side of the screen. That tells us how many hafnium atoms are up here, and how many pixels light up on the other side of the screen. That's how many hafnium atoms are down here. For each Ramsey time we do this. Yeah, for each Ramsey time we do this, and we do so we do a completely destructive measurement, and that destructive measurement gives us half of this point. We have to do it again to measure the molecules on this side to get one point here, and we end up taking uh, uh, for the, the the points that are uh, on the sides of the frames, we end up taking uh, ten of each of those configurations, and the ones on the tops and bottoms, we end up taking four in each of those configurations, and each of these are completely destructive measurements. Uh, so that's why it ends up taking. Uh, uh, 20 minutes to take a whole block, which for uh, this is a block divided by eight. So this uh, data here, which only goes out to one and a half seconds, takes like uh, two and a half minutes or something. Then how do you normalize the number of initial molecules? I guess you, you count it up and down. Uh, so we we uh, we can, well, one, you can see how many uh, fluctuations in the total hafnium fluoride number that show up on the screen because they're going to show, they're going to hit the MCP after the hafnium ball. But uh, we, I don't, we, uh, we, we can just count the number of fluctuations that shows up here on average over the 10 shots we count here and the 10 shots we count here and use that for normalization. Yeah. 
Yes. So I might have missed it, but I've only entered the, the translation to frequency the after life a moment or anywhere else in the systematics. But how sensitive are you to just the understanding of the atomic physics of the hafnium fluoride? Yeah, it's exactly estimating that effective internal field. Yeah, that, so that, that's that's a good question. So the effective electric field of 23 gigavolts per centimeter is known to about the five percent level. Mm -hmm. Um so uh, in principle we're limited by that. But it only really starts to matter once you uh uh, have a measurement that's farther away from zero. So we multiply because you know the, the 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 measurement we made is like you know negative one plus or minus two. So yeah. the percent error on that's pretty big. Um, so it turns out that uh, uh, you do need to know the size of that reasonably well in order to convert to it uh, from the frequency you measured to the electrons you want to drive at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you don't need it incredibly precisely, which uh, is is fairly nice. Those calculations are incredibly complicated and involve. Uh, uh, Theorists who, who like dedicate themselves to these sorts of complicated molecular calculations, uh, they're just numbers that were handed. Um, and it, it just happens that uh, for thorium fluoride, the effective electric field is one and a half times bigger. And thorium oxide, the uh, uh, acne molecule that they use, it's like 90 gigavolts per centimeter. They got lucky with the larger uh, effective electric field than we did. Um, but yeah, that's those are those are calculations handed to us from a time. And it's basically because we have this offset measurement of both fertilization and all of these things that gets kind of out. Yeah, so so the the like, you know, um you know, we we make an incredibly careful measurement of what this frequency is. Um, but like, you know, what is what this 100 megahertz is, I I, I don't know what the uncertainty on that is, but it's certainly a lot bigger than 20 megahertz. Mm -hmm. Um so like how well we know like exactly the quantum mechanics of this state uh uh matters to the extent that we can make a precise measurement of this there they're actually like a, you know, a few parts of it that we don't know as nearly as well as you might think yeah you'll go back to the previous slide like in each not not this one with the when you have the wrong the yeah, yeah, yeah sorry yeah what what is limiting the uncertainty of the each data point you are taking here what what is the uncertainty of each data point we take here um so uh, each of these data points are, you know, a difference in the number we see here and the number we see here. Um, so uh, I mean, having having these better statistics, having more molecules than like the say. So at an early time, we have uh, closer to a thousand molecules uh, being measured here and here. What really sets the frequency is what the fringe looks like at late time, like at one and a half or three seconds. Um, and you know, just having better statistics and things, having more molecules, uh, be uh, in this state, in this state. And also having you know less noise and uh, uh, happening for our production is always helpful. But it turns out uh, a lot of the noise that shows up here from having different uh, uh, happening in fluoride production that gives noise to this plot uh, gets canceled out when you measure the frequency when you take the frequency up here and you subtract it from the frequency here. So the noise on uh, this plot is like I think close to uh, not quite a factor of ten, but like something around a factor of five larger uh, on the, the uncertainty measure for uh, the frequency compared to the different frequencies. So the different frequencies are held to the end. The Poisson statistics uh, on those counts? The Poisson statistics. Your error bars, you have some counts that you're getting these. There. Yeah, that's right. So there's some Poisson statistics for the number of ions you count? Uh, yeah, so there, there, there is, but that largely affects uh, this plot. And so we have I'm a. I'm just saying, it's yes, if that, let's determine that error bar. Has to be placed on the city. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so it's just basically just the, 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 the number of yeah, space for, for up here. But the, the, the important part is that a lot of that noise uh, goes away in the EDM measurements. So you're taking the difference between the two. Is there any place that squeezing can come to say a uh, same thing for squeezing, the Squeezing could be. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, there's, 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 uh, well, there, yeah, obviously, if you get under the, the standard quantum limit, that would be helpful. Um, but that's uh, not the direction that we're, we're pushing in. There seem to be easier gains than uh, this more precise quantum control uh, that we need to squeeze in. Actually, before people start talking about squeezing, if you do your counting not at the peaks of your thing, if you go down on the side, you actually get better statistics. Yeah, that's why that's why we take more data on the sides than we do on the top. Yeah, so, so you need the, the top. The top actually there. don't help you that much. You just take like four points around the top. So you, yeah, the so, so the, the top has zero. Yeah, the top, the top has zero sensitivity to the EDM, that's right. Yeah. Uh, but having the tops tells you the contrast of the fringe at late time, yeah. which uh, you, you need some knowledge of that to uh, uh, make this measurement. I will just take the question. So you showed your uh, explanation of the uh, 
uh, results. Yeah. Is there a way you can combine them and put a better bond? Yeah. So let me just go through. There's like a slide that should be right after. Um, so uh, this is like sort of the combined bound. I have to explain what's going on here. So I, I told you that we measured the electrons electric drive for a moment. That's not, uh, that, that is true. What we really did though is we measured the time inertial symmetry violation in a happening chloride molecule. And that's actually sensitive to two uh, 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 parameters that could generate uh, basically two, two underlying time reversal physics uh, things that could generate uh, EDM in the uh, happening chloride molecule. So what those are is one that could be from the electrons electric drive component, or it could be from a scalar pseudo scalar electron nucleon interaction that violates time reversal symmetry as well. Um, so if you so what's about what I did when I showed you the limit on the EDM is I assumed that this term is zero. Let's just use our frequency to measure to set a limit on that. You can go the other way. You can say assume this is zero. Let's use our frequency to set a limit on what uh, this uh, 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 scalar pseudo scalar interaction is. Uh, and then uh, really what we do, uh, one experiment does on its own is it sets uh, you know, linear a linear limit on the linear combination of these two. But because if you only have one molecule and measure one uh, of these, uh, yeah, if you only have one molecule to measure both of these, you'll, you'll never know, like maybe this is large or this is large, but they cancel perfectly. So in green, that's what our measurement looks like. Uh, and in gray, acne has different coefficients, basically ground sensitive there for these two things. Um, so that's what their measurement looks like. And you'd like them to be perfectly perpendicular, but they're not very perpendicular at all. But even with that, you can use the two combined to set a limit on these two parameters together. And I say that's what, uh, if, you're, if you're looking at combining the two experiments, this is the sort of plot uh, you'd be looking at. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. If anyone has one? I do have another statistical one. So you showed this table of systematic errors. Yeah. What is the assumption in which you can add them in quadrature? Uh, you have to assume they're uncorrelated, right? So if you have, uh, uh, basically, you know, you have... Uh, so for statistical errors, I have gone to the max once in my life that I can do that. You were saying for systematic, it's the same one. Yeah, so so say 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 I have, you know, two systematic errors and they're both, you know, roughly as large as each other. Um, you know, I expect one to like, like, you know, I could, uh, well, certainly I have on them so as large as each other. So say I, I have, you know, uh, mean value of zero with like a uncertainty of say three, right? Maybe one of them is plus two and one of them is minus one, and that'll probably bring you somewhere in the middle. And because these are uncorrelated, uh, when you add, when you try to figure out the total error bar, bar of these two different uh, uncertainties, you just have an imposter. Um, so, so that this wouldn't be true if, for example, all of these Berry's phase uh, uh, uncertainties were somehow correlated with one another, like if there was one. Uh, effect where you know all of these are a combination of an electric field like this, and then like five different other things. If there's you know this electric field multiplied by A, this electric field multiplied by B, this electric field multiplied by C, then you say, oh, those are correlated. You shouldn't just add them in quadrature. Um, as far as we know, as far as we understand, none of these are uh, correlated with one another. Um, it's always possible that uh, uh, we're, we're wrong about the size of any of these, or are wrong about the fact they're correlated. Um, I don't think we are. Uh, and uh, yeah, so so and, and it's fairly standard in these proof measurements to have these plugs true. And the nice thing is, you know, even if this needs to be inflated a little bit, it's still small compared to the statistical uncertainty, and you definitely have these in plugs true. Uh, so it won't it won't influence the total air bar of the experiment there. That's debatable a little bit, but the sum of all your things is lower than your statistics, so yeah, that's just great sum of lower, so you don't have to get into that debate okay. really. And you also assume all the uncertainties or errors are following the Gaussian distribution, and otherwise, you can just just adding them together. Yeah, yeah. So if they're if they're uh, uh, I mean if they're all uncorrelated Gaussian distribution, then yeah, you can you can have multiple Um Yeah, got them all together. It's less than twenty. So. Yeah, but but yeah, even even if they all go the same way, then then it's still not a uh, huge factor. So. Okay, we're gonna have to stop there. So let's thank Trevor again.